Science and Human Origins, Chapter 5, The Science of Adam and Eve. We've uh, been going through the book Science and Human Origins, and we're down to what is the last chapter. The first chapter, the first four chapters had to do with uh, various things about uh, whether evolution could manage to produce uh, the humanity that we see today without assistance and uh, whether the fossil record pointed that way, whether the genome pointed that way. Today we're going to talk about a slightly different subject which is the science of Adam and Eve. Can the human genomes that we have now be dovetailed into a, an origin of a single man and a single woman. And of course, right afterwards is the authors and um, uh, and Gauger is uh, senior research in scientist at the Bi Biologic Institute, and she's been doing <coughs> molecular genetics and genomic engineering, and she's studying metabolic pathways. She got a B.S. in biology from MIT. PhD in developmental biology from the University of Washington, so well educated in standard universities. She studied Drosophila, embryogenesis, and then she went to Harvard University, so she's not dumb. She cloned and characterized the, just, the Drosophila kinesin light chain. Her research has been published in various uh, journals, Nature, Development, the Journal of Biological Chemistry and Biocomplexity. That's the person who wrote this chapter. The Science of Adam and Eve starts out with a little paragraph at the beginning. Using population genetics, some scientists have argued that there is too much genetic diversity to pass through a bottleneck of just two individuals. But that turns out not to be true. And that's what will be said in a nutshell. In chapter one, I, that is uh, Ann Gauger, argued that our similar anatomy and DNA sequences are not sufficient to demonstrate that we share a common ancestor with chimps. Using peer-reviewed scientific literature about tra transitional fossils and what is known about current chimp and human anatomy, she concluded that there are too many anatomical changes in too little time for neo-Darwinian processes to accomplish the supposed transition from our last common ancestor with chimps to us. But the current challenge concerning our origins involves more than fossils, anatomy, and improbable Darwinian scenarios. Now that DNA sequencing has become relatively simple and cheap, researchers are gathering vast amounts of human sequence data. They use the genetic variation they find to reconstruct past events in our genetic history. They derive evolutionary trees, estimate ancestral population sizes, and even calculate when and where our ancestors migrated out of Africa. Based on this kind of work, some have argued that we cannot have come from just two first parents. This argument directly contradicts the traditional belief of many Christians that humanity started with an original couple. Adam and Eve. Those affiliated with the groups like the Biologus Foundation have gone so far as to say that Christians must abandon a belief in Adam and Eve as sole parents of the human race because scientific arguments supposedly have disproven the possibility of their existence. And there's a whole um, article that went through Christianity Today um, saying this kind of thing. Now. And Gauger says, I am a scientist and not a theologian, but I feel obliged to speak. The challenge being posed to two first parents is a scientific one, so it deserves a scientific response. My purpose in this chapter is not to engage in biblical interpretation or to pass judgment on the various views Christians hold about Adam and Eve. Instead, I propose to focus on the scientific argument and its validity. Population genetics arguments against Adam and Eve come in many forms. Here I will examine one of the strongest cases against the first couple. The argument based on genetic variation in human leukocyte antigen 
or HLA, if you're in a familiar with that, uh, genes, some of the most variable genes in the human genome. When I began this study, I was prepared to accept, now listen to this carefully, because she's setting out her own belief system before she started looking. When I began this study, I was prepared to accept that there was too much genetic diversity among these genes to have passed through just two first parents. To my surprise, I found that even this most polymorphic, or most varied, region of our genome does not rule out the possibility of a first couple. And even more, buried within this region is evidence that suggests something more than common descent is responsible for our genetic makeup. So she's going to turn the argument around and say, you're looking at something that may even be intelligently designed. The science here is complex. In order to critically assess the arguments being made, I've had to include a fair amount of technical dis discussion. I realize that parts of the chapter may be challenging to some readers, but I try to provide a clear statement of my, my major points in non-technical language along the way. And she begins with HLA genes. HLA genes, human leukocyte, antigen genes are involved in immune defense. They bind and present foreign peptides on the surface of immune cells or leukocytes, particular kinds of leukocytes, in order to trigger a response by other immune cells. A number of these HLA genes are present in mammals, presumably to provide immunity against a wide variety of diseases and parasites. Figure 5.1 shows the location of the main HLA genes in humans. And in this, we're going to be talking specifically about the HLA-DR, which is close to the HLA-DQ, HLA-DP close, and then HLA-A, and then B, and then C. Those of you who've in medicine may remember HLA-B27 and, and its relationship to several diseases, including ankylosing spondylitis. You notice that this whole thing is a tiny portion of chromosome 6. There are many versions or alleles current, currently known for each HLA gene. Because of this, the HLA complex re represents one of the most difficult challenges to the idea that we came from just two first parents. If there are literally hundreds of alleles for these genes in the present human population, where did they come from? Two people can pass on at most four versions. Did all these alleles come from just two individuals with four or fewer ancestral versions? Four because two for each chromosome on each person. To answer that question, I need to explain something about the methods being used in these studies and what their underlying assumptions are. First, she's going to introduce population genetics. In the 1930s and 40s, Darwin's theory of evolution and Mendel's theory of genetics were combined, creating what is now called the modern synthesis, or what I prefer to call neo-Darwinism. Uh, this is, again, the Reader's Digest version, because we don't have time to read the whole thing. Mathematical models uh, to extrapolate from existing genetic variation in populations to what may have happened to those populations in the past. That's what uh, the modern synthesis is. Um, because all of these models have their roots in Darwinism, they assume that natural selection acting on stochastic processes, that's purely random processes, without consideration for the or organism's needs, is sufficient to explain all evolutionary change. The stochastic processes that generate genetic variations include mutation, changes in DNA sequence, recombination, that is rearrangement or swapping of genetic information between chromosomes, genetic drift, the stochastic loss of a genetic information due to failure to reproduce. Um, if you have one in uh, you know, one whole tribe gets killed off, all of its genes are lost, and if they happen to be unique in some way, then you've just killed off uh, 
a unique gene that used to be in the human gene pool. Um, that tends to reduce the power of natural selection to drive change, especially in populations of a million or less. Note that for neo-Darwinism, there is no room for direction or guidance in evolution. The equations of popular genetics require certain simplifications in order to make the mathematics work. A constant background mutation rate, a constant population size with no migration, common descent is the underlying cause of sequence similarity. Those are the principles you have to have to begin. The population genetics challenge to two first parents is now outlined. In the 1990s, a population biologist named Francisco Ayala, who's also an ardent evolutionist and anti-intelligent design advocate, um, set out to challenge the idea of two individual first parents using sequence information from one of the, H one of the HLA genes, and he published it in Molecular uh, Biology and Evolution. Uh, pardon me, no, he published his in Science. That that's another person that did the same kind of thing. So there's more people that have done this than just one. Ayala chose HLA-DRB1 to make his point. That's HLA-DR, the B1 segment, and we're going to see that in just a minute. Because at that time, there were already hundreds of different versions of HLA-DRB1 known. He had reason to suspect Therefore, that there might have been considerable diversity in HLA DRB1 at the time chimp and human first lineages first supposedly developed. And this is a drawing of HLR DR, and there's an A segment, and then there's a B1 segment that goes with it. And between these two, there's a peptide that can be bound. And it's a particular kind of peptide because of the shape of HLA DRA and primarily HLA DRB1. And the variations mean a different kind of peptide will be bound. The HLA, HLA DRB1 protein combines with another protein called HLA DRA to form <coughs> a, a di dimeric protein, which we've seen that drawing called HLA-DR. The dimer is a protein complex composed of su two subunit proteins that fit together. This protein dimer is embedded in the cell membrane of antigen-presenting cells. That's a particular kind of immune cell. Um, the dimer forms a peptide binding pocket that binds foreign peptides and presents them to other immune cells in order to trigger the, the production of appropriate antibodies. The reason why there are so many variants of HLA-DRB1 is that lots of variation in the peptide binding pocket ensures that many different foreign peptides can be recognized and bound. This is a good thing because it strengthens immunity. If a new parasite or disease-causing microbe comes along, the chances are increased that some individual will have an allele of HLA-DRB1 able to bind the invader's broken up proteins and trigger the immune system to mount a defense against them and, of course, in the end, survive. Here's the interesting thing. Nearly all the genetic variations in the HLA-DR dimer and thus the variations in peptides that can be bound come specifically from just one portion of the HLA-DRB1 gene namely exon 2. Now there are actually six different exons and in between there are five introns. And uh, so this is the second exon and everything else is pretty much the same in everybody but that particular area varies quite a bit. The rest of the HLA-DRB1 or the HLA-DRA genes do not vary very much. Ayala can obtain chimp, human, and macaque DNA sequences from just exon 2 of HLA-DRB1 and reconstructed the phylogenetic history of those sequences using population genetics algorithms. Now, um, 
it has a little note explaining what phylogenetic, uh, phylogenesis is. And uh, basically it's a computerized thing that involves uh, how much change you have to get to go from one place to another, uh, from one s sequence to another. And measuring those things give you uh, uh, branches. Um, he drew an evolutionary tree that most closely fit the pattern of genetic variation in exon 2. Then, using estimates from other sources for the average mutation rate in the time that chimps and humans last shared a common ancestor, he calculated how far back on this tree, on his tr tree, that point of common ancestry was. Drawing a line across the tree at the point, he counted how many ancestral branches he crossed. That gave him a retrospective estimate of how many HLAD RB1 alleles there must have been in the population at the time of the chimp human last common ancestor. So, the, and interestingly enough, the reference is, of course, in Science Magazine, to the myth of Eve, molecular biology, and human origins. It bothered him that there was a mitochondrial Eve. This is a theological paper as much as it is a scientific paper. He's attacking a uh, if you like, uh, well, science, history, religion, all kind of views. It's not, um, they're not easily separable here. And the thing that's interesting to me is this. Since he's bringing in history and particularly religion in this, this should have been reviewed by somebody who is looking at it from a historical and from a religious point of view, if it's truly going to be peer-reviewed. And as we'll see, there's a problem here. To illustrate the basic process he followed, Anne Gugger has drawn a simple example of a phylogenetic gene tree. To the left is the oldest part of the tree, as time passes, the simple gene, single gene duplicates and diverges, then splits again several more times. And the final number of duplicates on the right is five. So you go from the single gene to A, B, C, D, E. Now, at 50 years ago, you would draw a line here. You would have all <coughs> five variant, variants. If you were to draw the line 250 years ago, you can see that you would get two variants. Presumably, if you drew the line 500 years ago, you would get only one variant. Now, normally population genetics make the length of each horizontal line proportional to the amount of genetic change. The longer the length, the more nucleotide differences there are. Um, that assuming the nucleotide differences are due to mutation over time and assuming that mutation occurs at a constant rate, and that's of course not a sure thing, one can count backwards to an estimated time in evolutionary history, in this case, 50 and 250 years ago, and draw a line vertically through the tree. The number of lineages crossed by the line determine how many separate lineages were present at each particular time. And as uh, she notes, that five lineages 50 years ago, two lineages 250 years ago. Following this procedure, Ayala calculated that there were 32 separate versions of the entire HLA-DRB1 gene present. Now this is estimating only from the uh, exon 2, of course. That present, makes something for a very small part of the entire gene. Um, of the entire protein as well. Um, and, the, and the estimate, um, 32 versions at the estimated time of our last common ancestor with chimps, which is four to six million years ago. Also not a sure thing, these estimates keep changing. <laughs> In order for all those variant alleles to make it to modern times, he further estimated that the minimum size of the ancestral population was no fewer than 4,000, with a long-term average effective population size of 100,000. And uh, again, that was published in Science. 
This large number is necessary in a steady state population model like Ayala's. Under such conditions, assuming random mating and genetic drift, alleles are likely to be lost over time so that a large starting population is necessary to guarantee continued transmission of all the alleles. If you have too small a uh, population, you get basically a bottleneck. Because of this minimal estimate of 4,000, Ayala claimed that at no time was it possible for the human population to have passed through a bottleneck of two. In his view, there's just too much ancestral diversity in HLA DRB1. Now notice that it should be a bottleneck of four instead of a bottleneck of two. Or maybe he's referring just to population. Um, the challenge to the challenge. So this is her challenge back. Ayala's claims against the literal Adam and Eve are based on population genetic models for how gene frequencies change in populations over time and how ancestral gene lineages tend to coalesce. The equations used to reconstruct these trees and to calculate ancestral population sizes depends on simplifications and assumptions to make the mathematics tractable. These is explicit assumptions include a constant background diffusion ra mutation rate over time, lack of selection for genetic change on the d DNA sequences being studied, random breeding among individuals, no migration in or out of the breeding population, and a constant population size. If any of these assumptions turns out to be unrealistic, the results of a model may be seriously flawed. <coughs> there are also hidden assumptions buried in population genetics models, assumptions that rely upon the very thing they're meant to demonstrate. For example, tree drawing algorithms assume that a tree of common descent exists. Although to be fair, if we're talking about humans, I think it's probably fair to say that, that at least for humans, you probably can have a common ancestry. The uh, population genetics equations also assume that random processes are the only causes of genetic change over time, an assumption drawn from naturalism. What if non-natural causes or even unknown natural causes that do not act randomly have intervened to produce genetic change? Well, of course, that makes, until we know how those processes work, uh, that makes it impossible to apply the equations accurately. It turns out that the particular DNA sequence from HLA-DRB1 that Ayala used in his analysis was guaranteed to give an overestimate because he inadequately controlled for two of the above assumptions. One, the assumption that there is a lack of selection for genetic change on the DNA sequence being studied and two, the assumption of a constant background mutation rate over time. HLA-DRB1 is known to be under strong selection for heterozygosity, meaning that you have two different versions of the gene gives you a better chance of dealing with parasites and disease. So most of us will be heterozyg heterozygotes, the homozygotes, uh, either don't form or die out early. And uh, so we're, we're under strong selection for heterozygosity. That means that you're not dealing with um, something that's random at that point. Not only that, the particular region of the gene Ayala studied, exon 2, appears to have a mutation rate much higher than the background mutation rate. In fact, it is the most variable region of one of the most variable genes in our genome. And it may be a hotspot for gene conversion, a kind of mutation particularly likely to confuse assumptions of common descent and parsimony in tree drawing. So the trees may not be valid even though mathematically they sound like they ought to be. Ayala did not use a math uh, pardon me, Ayala did use a mathematical fudge factor to control for the first problem, that of uh, preference for heterozygosity, uh, more than one different kind in each one of us, um, but did not correct for the second problem. Didn't correct for the fact that there's a hot spot. And the magnitude of the hot spot will be seen a little bit later in an another note uh, or in another a study of another part of the genome. A later study by Bergstrom et al. 
examined the same HLA-DRB1 gene, but used intron 2, which is right next to exon 2, and, uh, but it's a portion of the gene that's not translated into protein, and they chose that because they wanted to avoid the confounding factor uh, effects of strong selection, which we've already seen. They verified that this intron had a mutation rate close to the genomic background. You know, it's just not so much of a hot spot. In contrast to Ayala's study, this study concluded that only seven versions of the gene existed in the ancestral population from which both chimps and humans supposedly came around four to six million years ago, and that the population had an estimated size of 10,000 rather than 100,000 that was estimated by Ayala. And that went into nature genetics. In other words, by being careful about just two of the assumptions above assumptions, these researchers arrived at a dramatically lower estimate for the number of HLA-DRB1 alleles in the ancestral population than the number Ayala found in his study, that is, 7 versus 32. But the problems with Ayala's model go even deeper, as we shall see in the next section. Ayala created his phylogenetic tree based on exon 2 sequences, while Bergstrom used intron 2 sequences. A third study um, by Doxialis et al., and uh, that was published in Molecular Immunology in 2008, uh, examined the phylogenetic histories of chimp, macaque, and human DR HLA DRB1 genes again, but this time using sequences taken from either exons 2 or introns one through four. They did all four introns. Surprisingly, the tree alignments using exon two and the ones giving, uh, using introns one through four give markedly different pictures of the gene's phylogenetic history, even though both sets of sequences come from the very same genes. There's a substantial difference in the phylogenetic relationships Exon 2 comparisons typically showed cross-species associations, while intron com uh, comparisons showed within-species associations. And uh, a simplified version, uh, illustration of the discordant phylogenetic trees is shown in Figure 5.4. And uh, for the actual trees, you can, you know, look at uh, Doxiatis et al. And, um, this should be just surprising, although the trees based on genetic comparison sometimes do not show the same phylogenetic relationships as the species themselves do, as in the case for exon 2 sequences. When this happens, it indicates something uh, unusual is going on. And let me illustrate that, or let her illustrate that. Um, you'll notice that in introns 1 through 4, the McCake genes are closely, most closely related to each other. The chimp genes are most closely related to each other. And um, the chimp genes are a little more re closely related to human genes than the McCake genes. So if you're making a tree, this all makes kind of sort of evolutionary sense. And the human genes are all most closely related to each other. Now when you turn to exon 2, you have a grouping that includes macaque, chimp, and human in the same grouping, and then separated from that in another one, you have uh, pardon me, chimp, human, human together, and then a third grouping that has the macaque, human, and then chimp, human, human. The question is, you know, have we been interbreeding with monkeys? Um, I don't think so. But, you know, in, in introns one to four would make you believe that there's been a separation. But exon two puts us all in the same category. Something fishy is going on. It's even more unusual that trees drawn from adjacent segments of the same genome agree, disagree with one another. It's not that exon 2 is highly variable and the introns are more conserved because this is not the case. Intron lineages can differ quite a bit from one another. 
Rather, the intron lineages group together according to species, while the exon 2 lineages do not. Some evolutionary biologists try to ex explain this discordance between the HLA DRB1 trees by arguing that this proves that these genes have their origin in deep time, before the lineages of chimps, humans, and macaques separated, and that this is, this is the exon 2 data that defines the gene's history. And there's a reference for that. And others think that there has been cross-species shuffling of ancient peptide binding motifs between two uh, different uh, exon 2 sequences over time, but leaving the intron lineages unchanged. Um, it's not clear, however, that such a patchwork cross-species assortment of exon 2 sequences could have been acquired without disrupting the species-specific introns. How do you get that to, how do you get the introns to, to make a nice tree and the exons not? That's the question. Furthermore, this would require that the incipient species populations intermingled for a prolonged period of time, and uh, <laughs> the intermingling is highly unlikely to have lasted for 30 million years, though, which is the last time McCakes, uh, chimps, and humans supposedly had a common ancestor. And the fact that the intron sequences do not associate by species with branch lengths as long or longer than the exon branch lengths argues that many of these intronic lineages have been evolving independently for quite a while. Indeed, some for as long as 30 or 40 million years, or perhaps they were designed differently. Therefore, this phylogenetic discordance is something that cannot be explained by common ancestry, especially when one considers an additional piece of information. The HLA-DRB1 region of chromosome 6 shows little or no signs of recombination. HLA, it's, uh, they'll be explained in just a little bit, and I'll go over that. Uh, HLA DRB1's closest neighbors, HLA DBQ, DQB and HLA DQA, also bind and present foreign peptides to other immune cells, like HLA DRB1. According to Raymond et al., this, this region shows extreme linkage disequilibrium meaning that there is little or no reciprocal recombination between these genes. Recall that chromosomes uh, assort fairly randomly during the production of a new human being or a new chimpanzee, as the case may be. Uh, recall that in some cases, two chromosomes that are matched up together will cross over at a certain point so that part of chromosome A will go with part of chromosome B to the new kid. Um, and uh, this area here doesn't cross over very much at all. So you have an area that basically stays together in one block. That's what they mean by linkage uh, disequilibrium. And again, there's a reference to that. This lack of recombination is highly unusual because it extends over 80,000 bases of DNA. They're all inherited as one block. Stretches of DNA that do not go undergo genetic recombination are called haplotypes. So this is, you have a haplotype that kind of stays together all as one block. Normally, given the supposed age of these haplotypes, recombination should have occurred roughly every 150 nucleotides on the average. Recombination does take place elsewhere in the region, just not in the vicinity of HLA-DRB1. So these are they're blocks that are inherited. And um, there's an illustration of those blocks if you want more information uh, in one of their references. Despite the fact that there are hundreds of alleles for each HLA gene, only certain recombinations of, H of alleles of HLA-DQ and DR tend to occur together. They are inherited as a block. This may, it, it may be that particular combinations of alleles work especially well together, so that everybody else dies out. Um, it may be that 
recombination is suppressed by some other mechanism. The body knows don't cross at this point. These co-inherited combinations of alleles constitute the basic haplotypes of HLA-DRB1. Most researchers now agree that there are just five of these basic haplotypes in humans. Which HLA-DRB1 gene of a particular haplotype has, which, which one it has, tends to specify the particular allelic combinations of other genes in the haplotype. Ba in other words, if you know one, you know the others because they all are inherited as a unit. Based on the amount of background genetic changes in the introns, three haplotypes appear to be ancient, going back 30 million years or more. These are the haplotypes we have in common with chimps and macaques. Two haplotypes are more recent, based on their accumulating background mutation, and date back using the standard estimates to four to six million years ago. Thus, depending on when one places the, the time of the proposed divergence, these may have been if, as few as three ancestral haplotypes or as many as five when humans diverged. Now remember, we're allowed four. Here's the whole point in simple language. The argument from population genetics has been that there is too much genetic diversity to pass through a bottleneck of two individuals, as would be the case for Adam and Eve. But that turns out not to be true. There are just five basic versions of the HLA haplotype. Three appear to be ancient, predating any supposed evolutionary splint between chips, chimps and humans, and two are more recent. Sometime before, after the, uh, when we think, or when they think, I should say, um, the supposed evolutionary chip uh, split between chimps and humans took place. Uh, at least one of these haplotypes appears to be missing in chimps. Given the difficulties involved in estimating the times of divergence due to the unusual genetic behavior of the region, it is possible that four or fewer of these haplotypes predate our supposed divergence from chimps. Each person carries two copies of the class two haplotype, so each person can carry two different alleles of HLA DRB1. Therefore, those four haplotypes could potentially be carried by just two individuals. This means that a first couple could have carried sufficient genetic diversity to account for four basic haplotypes, especially given the possibility of rapid population expansion afterward, which happened before the flood and then after the flood. Be fruitful and multiply. We have dropped from an estimated 32 lineages based on DLA, uh, DRB1 exon 2 comparisons to seven lineages using DLA, DRB1 intron 2 comparisons, and then to between three and five ancestral haplotypes when the whole region is considered. This is a remarkable reversal. What once seemed to be a rock solid argument against the existence of a first couple has now dwindled considerably. The genetic analysis in indicates that a first couple is possible. At the very least, it is fair to say that HLA haplotype diversity cannot rule out <coughs> two first parents. Well, what about the problem of genetic drift and the concomitant need for a large population to prevent loss of variant haplotypes? Well, that problem applies for a steady state, constant size population model, but not in the case where rapid population growth is taking place. In the case of a newly emerging or created species, rapid expansion would make it possible for all haplotypes to be preserved. In fact, there is evidence that HLA diversity increases rapidly after a new population is founded, although not usually to this degree. Um, so maybe even uh, fudging it a little bit uh, would be appropriate uh, if, there's a, if there's extra diversity that, is, uh, that happens in humans if we're rapidly increasing. Uh, the illustration is taken from Zar Darwin's finches, of course, but uh, it might apply to humans. Now I would like to move in a more challenging direction. What if our sequence similarities are not the result of common descent? What if we began from two intelligently designed first parents? Is there any evidence in the data I've presented to indicate that this might be the case? If so, all this analysis of how many ancient haplotypes we share with chimps doesn't really matter if God intervened more than once. 
there certainly are surprising patterns of genetic variation within HLA-DRB1 that suggest unknown processes may be operating. Let me propose that a process exists which generates specific hypervariability within exon 2 and suppresses recombination elsewhere. And by the way, we have something like that in the immune system. The process is targeted to generate diversity precisely in the peptide binding domain. She suggests that intelligent design had to be involved at the beginning in order to rapidly generate HLA diversity after the foundation of our new species. In other words, we were designed to have those changes take place. That is, of course, assuming we came from two first parents. Evidence supporting this idea comes from the fact that HLA DRB1 diversity has, in fact, increased very rapidly by anyone's count, going from a handful of variants over 600 allele to over 600 alleles in six million years or less. And of course, if it's less, then the variability has skyrocketed. Also, the HLA-DRB1 variable regions in exon 2 show a patchwork, cross-species relationships to their surrounding DNA sequences, making their origin hard to account for by common descent. Their repeated use of similar motifs from different species may in instead indicate common design. In other words, it's not intermarriage. It's actually areas that are made to change with time, and they're made to change in both uh, species, or all three species in this case, uh, in the same way. She further suggests that this process may be due to human specific, may be more human specific, since other primates don't show nearly the same degree of allelic diversity within lineages as humans do we were designed with more of this uh, natural variability in mind. And as a reference to support the last statement. This proposal can be supported at least in part by published data. Both gene conversion and hypermutation are known to generate antibody diversity in other immune cell lineages. That is, the same process is used for antibodies and uh, I've just I had to put the references on the next li uh, slide because I couldn't fit them all together, but you can see. This is um, Gene Development 2004. Sequence analysis of HLA DRB1 alleles reveal that recombination events either strictly located at exon 2 or involving adjacent introns have occurred. Um, so they're like many recombinations that, that switch just that area and nothing else. And indicate that interlineage recombinations may be hidden and are perhaps more frequent than currently expected. So there is some hypervariability here. And again, there's a reference to that uh, Journal of Immunology 2000. Others have identified sequ sequence features thought to be involved in recombination processes some of which are highly conserved across DLA, HLA, DRB1 alleles. Um, so they do rec recombine just only in little tiny parts of this area and the rest of it does not recombine, which is quite fascinating. In addition, several human population studies indicate that many HLA class 1 and class 2 genes undergo rapid interallelic recombination. For example, Hedrick and Kim report that new alleles that appear to be the result of micro recombination, um, that flipping over of little tiny areas, between other alleles have been found in South American American Amerindians and other populations. Because the Americans, Americas have probably been populated only for the last 10,000 to 20,000 years, in other words, you don't have genetic, uh, long periods of genetic time to, to worry about that. Uh, that is about a, a thousand human generations. And uh, we would probably, uh, even a conservative uh, viewpoint would say probably the last 4,000 years. So we're not disagreeing that much from their estimate there. The new variants which do not appear in Asian samples may have arisen during this period. And there's a reference for that. These include several novel variants in HLA-DRB1, HLA-DPB1, 
and HLA B. Hedrick and Kim go on to say, there is direct evidence, this is fascinating, there is direct evidence that the rate of micro recombination at some MHC loci is high. And of course they quote uh, another paper that examined the rate of interallelic gene conversions at the HLA DPB1. This is not DR, but it's DP, and it's the same um, it's the same part of the of the molecule. That, lo that, that, that locus in sperm from male heterozygotes for six regions of the highly variable region exon 2. This is, in other words, not the same one, but a, but a particular, uh, particularly close parallel. In 111,675 sperm, they observed nine interallelic conversions for a rate of 0.81 times 10 to the minus 3, nearly 1 in 1,000 gametes. Or, uh, pardon me, in, in 10,000 gametes. It's uh, 12,400, if you want to do the math. And uh, there's a reference for that. That one got into um, uh, nature, genetics. Given this data, it seems not unreasonable to propose that HLA-DRB1 diversity is the result of a process that generates specific hypervariability. This one little area changes a lot. And or gene conversion within exon 2 in order to rapidly generate HLA diversity. The existence of such a process essentially demonstrates any population genetics, essentially demolishes any population genetics arguments about ancestral population sizes. The HLA story illustrates well the strengths and limitations of science. Scientific claims are provisional, always subject to revision. In particular, retrospective calculations should be treated with caution because of the number of unknown variables and hidden assumptions involved. Where ancient genetic history is involved, dogmatic statements are out of place. I chose to look at the HLA DRB1 study story because it seemed to provide the strongest case for population genetics against two parents. If it were true that we shared 32 separate lineages of HLA DRB1 with chimps, it would indeed cause difficulties for an, an original couple. But as we've seen, the data indicate that it is just possible that it is possible for us to co have come from just two first ancestors, first parents. Moreover, the data indicate that DNA similarity is not going to be a simple story to unravel. There are already regions of human DNA known to more closely relate, uh, resemble gorilla sequences and chimp sequences. Now we have sequences that resemble McCake DNA, a primate not part of the hominid group. Furthermore, when adjacent regions of DNA yield different evolutionary trees linked to species that diverged well before the putative most recent common ancestor of chips and humans, something unusual is going on. The result, this result was a surprise to me and threw me back into consideration, re, consideration of the whole story of our common descent from ape-like ancestors. I already knew from my own research, this is Anne Gallagher, of course, speaking, that similarity of form or structure was not enough to demonstrate that neo-Darwinism, neo-Darwinian common descent was possible. I knew that the general, the genu genuine <coughs> protein innovations were beyond the reach of naturalistic processes. I therefore began to re-examine everything I knew or thought I knew about human origins. I reviewed paleoanthropology, evolutionary psychology, and population genetics research articles. I reviewed popular books and textbooks. I applied strict logic to the story of what would be required for the evol from our evolution from great apes. As a result of all this reading and reflection, although I was always skeptical about the plausibility of human evolution by neo-Darwinian means, I have now come to wonder about the this extent of common descent as well. She started out as somebody who, eh, common descent, sure, and now she says, data doesn't really fit. Currently, neo-Darwinian is the accepted explanation for our origin. It may be, though, that as we continue to investigating our own genomes, the Darwinian explanation for our similarity with chimps, namely common human descent, will evaporate we may discover additional features in our genome that defy explanation based on common ancestry. 
As evidence of common descent's insufficiency as the theory grows, alternative theories will need to be tested. But, and this is her final concluding statement, one thing is clear right now. Adam and Eve have not been disproven by science. And those who claim otherwise are misrepresenting the scientific literature. Now, I apologize, it's hard to compress that too much without losing half the people here. Probably we lost a few anyway. Um, as I read the chapter, it seems to argue that the challenge to the idea of Adam and Eve, that, to the idea that Adam and Eve came from population, pardon me, the challenge to the idea of Adam and Eve came from population genetics with several unexamined assumptions. Once you examine the assumptions, they can be shown not to fit at least some of the data from genetic studies, and more reasonable assumptions are much more compatible with two original ancestors. That's what I hear her saying. I think she makes a good argument. Um, I think it's obvious that she does not actually have a theological motive for arguing for two original ancestors. She started out, maybe so, maybe not. Look at the science. The detail given is, I think, astounding and quite useful if you have to argue in that area. And I think that the argument is even stronger than her article because one of the assumptions is that the, we know the human mutation rate and it turns out to be faster than what is usually estimated by evolutionary change, which is to say chimps are here, humans are here, um, that's twice the rate of mutation. That's the usual argument. And um, uh, I think if we were to put modern estimates for the mutation rate, we might find that that it pushes us down more into the thousands rather than to the millions of years. What Ayala and others have done is assume that evolutionary biology is true and then try to see whether an Adam and Eve story would fit. And not surprisingly, when they approach it that way, it doesn't. Now, I think they failed to take the story on its own terms. The story starts out by saying you started out with humans and that uh, there was rapid population expansion and therefore the strictures of, uh, uh, of you have to have so, much, so big a population so as not to lose things randomly actually doesn't apply. Just to give you one illustration, a design couple is indicated, a rapidly expanding population is indicated, and their constant mutation rate calibrated by chimpanzees and macaques is without biblical foundation. If they want to assume it for evolutionary purposes, that's fine. But if you're starting out asking, does the question fit, you really should use modern population uh, genetics and how fast mutations are happening in, the modern, uh, in modern humans and not extrapolate to chimpanzees. Now, I'm not saying by that that it's not ever fair to use the human ch uh, chimpanzee split as, as a guide to how fast mutations happen. If you're trying to assess an evolutionary theory, it is reasonable to take those as one estimate. Although if they disagree with the modern estimates by uh, orders of magnitude, which uh, they do happen to, you have to ask whether that's really a fair estimate for how fast things are diverging. But my point is that if you're going to try to disprove a biblical story, you have to apply biblical assumptions, not Ayala's scientific assumptions. Their approach is almost as ridiculous once we get rid of the evolutionary assumptions as trying to use antibody sequences to create a genetic tree. We know that antibodies mutate in individual humans. You and I make antibodies to coronaviruses. Um, we fiddle around with the antibodies and we find the ones that work the best and we actually make lots of those antibodies. None of those antibodies are coded for by our original DNA. What we do is we take a little piece from here, a little piece from here, a little piece from here, stick them all together and make an antibody. 
and sometimes we'll try a piece from here right next to it and it will make a better antibody or maybe three units down or um, the we have we have variable regions, we have hypervariable regions, and we have constant regions in the antibody. Those antibodies are all made by genetic engineering. If you were to use <coughs> those sequences to try to show how far back we had a, a common ancestor with chimpanzees, it would be laughable. And this is almost because these things are doing the same thing, and apparently they're hypermutable. That paper should not have passed peer review. Of course it did because the, the thrust of the paper, that there really is no mitochondrial Eve, <coughs> that we really don't have just two ancestors, fit the prejudice of the scientific community. And so they didn't really ask, does it really take the biblical story seriously and does it show that if you take biblical assumptions that they're just not tenable in this area. It doesn't. The experimental math is particularly interesting. Recall that one in a 12,406, I think it is, sperm, have you mutations in HLA deep E P1. That means if you take six billion people, you have 483,000 different variations. We're diverse. Are we surprised? That's way more than enough variation to take care of uh, Ayala's problem. Remember he said 32 original ancestors with that kind of variation? Uh, we easily could have come from two original people. I think that one of the things that this shows is that if you publish something in science that's anti-biblically -biblical, biased, it's going to get a softer review than if you publish something that supports the biblical record. But maybe that's just my view. It's now your turn to comment. I apologize to those who uh, uh, We'll have to leave at 11.30 because I've already used up all of your time. But for those of you who want to stick around, uh, we'll allow you to comment. It looks like uh, Ayala got caught uh, by ignoring the interons. He got caught red-handed, I might say, at that. <clears throat> but uh, Ayala is famous, and if folks are wondering, he's president of AAAS of the American Association for Events of the Science. And, uh, Very prestigious name. And he uh, participated in the Vatican Symposium on Creation Evolution, where they decided they didn't believe in intelligent design, but they did, did not believe in atheism. Uh, interesting. Uh, conclusion. If I understand right, he used to be a Catholic priest. I don't know whether he still is or not. Well, he's Catholic, I know, but I don't, yeah. know, I don't know if he was a priest or not. But uh, uh, they, they, always, <coughs> they always throw that into their little PBS Nova. Yeah. He is an ex-priest. Okay. Anyway, but um, uh, and th th this is this is interesting, very fascinating. I mean, this this is uh, uh, unfortunately it depicts uh, an attitude that uh, we also need to watch against uh, on the other side. But uh, wh what I'm uh, when I think about all this and so on, uh, so you pick on this little problem in exons and, uh, you know, make a big conclusion about it. Uh, what about the, if you're going to use those basic assumptions that, that Ayala did, uh, how in the world are you going to evolve a chimp type, whatever the ancestral type was, uh, to man? 
and produce the hundreds of thousands of mutations you need to what the mutation rates he has suggested and the time he's suggesting. Uh, you just, if you use those parameters, you can't even evolve uh, the organism. Why pick on such an isolated case like this to well, prove your point? Of course, that was her point in chapter one, <coughs> is that you can't get here from there without some help. Uh, and the interesting thing of it is where they try to prove that uh, you couldn't have had two organisms. Basically, they're, they're picking a spot where, as far as we can tell, there has been some help. And then they wonder why there's so much diversity. Why ignore the major picture uh, and to make such a big minor. point of it out of a minor one? And this, uh, but I guess that's, uh, we're all human nature. Well, we're all humans and so on. Uh, and, uh, you know, the old geological saying, uh, I never, never would have seen it if I hadn't believed it. Uh, when you're looking at geological things, probably goes beyond geology. Uh, if they hadn't believed it, why have they not seen the, to the bigger picture? I think it's on. Tap it. Is there a forum anywhere where these people have open discussions on this type of stuff? I know that as far as the, the educational community and so forth is, is that they will not listen to anything. They just shut it all down and say, you ignoramuses, why are you spoiling our children so that they can't be scientifically intelligent? Um, well, it's, it's, it's actually even worse than that. Go ahead, just pass it on. And we'll, we'll find somebody who wants one. Um, it's actually uh, even a little bit worse than that. They don't actually shut down the conversation. They leave one side of it open. Ayala got his paper published. It was easy. But you try to publish what Ann Gauger just did, you forget about it. Well, she got it into a book. I don't know, but there was, uh, what was it, Science Magazine or something that she got part of the discussion? Uh, I, I don't think, well, she's published other things. You can publish stuff that's kind of tangentially re related and you don't make the point. Or perhaps, well, actually what you do is you, you, you say there are big problems here with the standard model. And we need to consider new models. Uh, and you can do that uh, as long as they don't know who you are. And uh, although some people here don't like it, uh, probably one of the better examples of that is Robert Gentry, who published and published and published. And then they found out who he was. And all of a sudden, his publishing dried up, his access to funding dried up, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, if you want to, you can say, well, he was not careful or he was cantankerous or whatever. But he was that way before, and then all of a sudden it dried up. And I can tell you that there are lots of cantankerous people out there, if you want to make that that's what's really going on, uh, to publish. Um, uh, you get some of these people discussing intelligent design, and you'll probably find they'll be pretty, pretty vociferous. And uh, it's... What it is, is once they realize what's going on, they shut it down. Sometimes they don't really, if, if you're careful about what you're saying, you can do what Ann Gauger did and what Douglas Axe did and actually get some of these things published. And one of the phenomena that's happening is they're kind of what I might call gray publications, biocomplexity being one, where they're kind of you know, if intelligent design people publish stuff, uh, we'll put it in as long as there aren't any obvious major logical flaws or obvious uh, errors of, of uh, documentation of results. Uh, they will just, uh, they will, they're what you might call uh, ID friendly. And of course, the, the instant reaction to that is very much like what happened in climate change, where 
they try to discredit the uh, whole paper because they can't control what gets published in it. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's a big problem. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I think that peer review has been abused in this area probably more than anything else I've seen. I've heard some pretty exalted definitions of science in this class through the years. This doesn't sound like science to me. The word assumption overpowers everything else. So many assumptions. How can you do a science project based upon all of these assumptions, many of which are, are, have been disproved from the get-go? I would challenge you to, to build a house much simpler than all this genetics with assumptions. Well, that's a problem. Uh, and that's why I say if, if, if this were a fair journal, they would have had somebody from the other side able to review the article and say, but you missed this assumption and you missed this assumption, which would naturally come with a biblical story. You know, one of them being that you have a rather rapid population expansion, at least initially. Whereas the assumption that's being made is you've got a size population, maybe 10,000, maybe 100,000, that is more or less stable, and then uh, could everything have come from one, uh, one first couple, or uh, did it require the mixing of, uh, of a whole bunch of different areas? Uh, the assumption that you have a stable population is a, if I can put it that way, in this context, an anti-biblical assumption. Shouldn't any one of these assumptions disqualify the project? Uh, you know, science goes, uh, goes forward on the basis of assumptions. I'm not sure that you can, you can do assumption-free science. And that, I mean, that, that sounds kind of crazy, but like, for example, if you are trying to find out how fast something falls, you can take a strobe light, for example. You can turn the room dark otherwise. You can push it off the table and photograph it as it's falling with the strobe light illuminating it at particular intervals. You assume that the strobe light is going off at regular intervals. If that assumption is off, the pathway that you trace is going to be wrong. You assume that between the flashes, the object doesn't go zigzag like this and then find its way to the next spot, but rather that it follows an arc that's relatively straight. Uh, now, when we watch it in real time, it looks like it's going straight. It's a reasonable assumption. You know, for that matter, as we're sitting here, we're assuming that each other exists. It's a reasonable assumption, but it is, strictly speaking, an assumption. And I'm assuming that you're hearing what I have to say and that you're thinking about it and you're understanding it and you're accepting it or rejecting it and then speaking back to me based on what you think and that there is a real you. It's an assumption. The rest of the people who are watching here are assuming that I exist, that I think, that I'm talking, and that you're responding, and that you're making your own points, and I'm responding. It's an assumption. We don't know of any process that could produce a hologram of me that, that uh, interacts in the way I do. It's a lot easier to just assume that I'm real. And uh, but that's, all of science is based on assumptions. Uh, some are more reasonable than others, and I think that the point is not so much that it, you, you're doing it on the basis of assumptions, as is, are those assumptions reasonable? For that matter, when I get out my Bible, I assume that it was printed by people who had an interest in accuracy. And they're they, they had somebody trying to do accuracy in translation, 
In the meantime, somebody was doing accuracy in printing. Every once in a while, that assumption falls apart. There is a Bible out that says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Um, it's known as the wicked Bible for what I think are obvious reasons. Obviously, somebody didn't follow through with that. Uh, we have a comment here, uh, Ariel, and then over here. Is this out of juice? It, it does seem to me that uh, in this particular case that when you're especially attacking a biblical concept that you should not ignore the biblical population model. Uh, I, I think this is a serious, uh, serious uh, omission uh, and that uh, the accusation of bias is, is rather obvious. Oh yeah, and I agree. And you know, in, in science, if you have two opposing theories and somebody's arguing for one theory, it is not uncommon for them to be reviewed by a friendly critic, by a, an opposing critic, and by a neutral person. And uh, you know, if only the, if the opposing critic makes comments, but they don't seem to be germane, the editor will look at it and say, uh, he's just biased and not require the paper to completely accommodate to him, although he, he, may, he may say, but he has a good point here, and so you know, it'll be passed through and say, you may want to fix this part of your paper. And that's what should happen. But you see, this is friendly review. And so nobody's going to point out that Ayala is not taking the biblical record seriously, that he's building his model in a in what you might call an anti-biblical way of looking at things. And what Ann Gauger is, is caught him with his pants down. Frankly, I think that the scientific community would be better off if they had a few reviewers that reviewed things from the opposite point of view. I think they'd be more careful and they, the stuff that's put out would be of better quality and with fewer of these kinds of errors. If they want to be respected, well, they ought to move a little more in that direction. Yeah, well, uh, I have a feeling that there are some people in the community that would rather be, uh, that would rather be uh, polemic than respected. But mm -hmm. we'll see. I'd be, I'd be curious to know or to find out if Fayala is a Jesuit or not. Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. I wouldn't expect you to. And if they are willing to stand on both sides and make confusion and win people both ways, uh, for the purpose of Hegelian thesis, antithesis, and pain, we're in for a lot of hurt if we're going to try and find synthesis in that. Well. Um, uh, that would make a good project for somebody to try to report back on. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't know exactly where to begin, and I have enough on my plate to try to tease out those, those relationships. But, uh, but you may have a point there. Best to stand just on the Bible and... Yes, Nick. Yeah, I was uh, wondering if we are not partially to blame for the situation. Because most Adventists do not have a serious interest, with few exceptions like you and Ariel, Rob. Uh, I mean, most of us are interested in evangeli uh, evangelizing, yes. you know, getting converts. But we, we have very little interest in spending our lifetime in exploring these things that would perhaps give us a, how do you say, a more 
fruitful result if we did. So, in a sense, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe we are to blame for the situation and partially to blame for the situation. If we had a thousand Pogim, a thousand Ariel Roth, wouldn't you say that situation might be different? And then I have another question. I have another well, question. Shall I answer that question first? I'm sorry? Shall I answer that question first? Okay. Um, it is difficult to do this. Uh, it is more difficult to do this and get funded for it. Uh, I am fortunate in that I have a science-related but not science-dominated field where I can uh, gain employment without having to worry about whether people think my uh, uh, views on evolution are too extreme. Um, if you're in the business and one of the things you have to do is get grant money, uh, that makes it much more difficult. Uh, it's possible that our models should be extended to uh, try to uh, influence people to, uh, to uh, obtain a more, if you want to call it that, Pauline way of supporting yourself while you're doing this kind of thing. As we, we might need more tent makers who are evangelists, well, we may need more physicians who are uh, interested in the science religion aspect. Um, and I do see this as a huge mission field. Some people are sent to India. Some people are sent to the Middle East. Some people are sent to various other people in South America, Europe, wherever. We do have a mission to the, in, uh, to the uh, intellectual elite of Europe and North America. And it has been sadly neglected, uh, in my opinion, for too long. Um, the fact of the matter is the needs are everywhere. Uh, I don't know that I have enough wisdom to divide people up into what mission fields there are and put people in the right place. I assume God does. Uh, maybe this is one of the areas where we should be praying for more laborers to be sent <coughs> in. The harvest is ripe, but there are a few laborers. It's true here just as it is in some other places. And for a while there in Russia, we had huge opportunities and not nearly enough people to take advantage of them. Uh, that changes from time to time. I just hope that God influences all of us to be aware of where he wants each one of us to be so that uh, when that time calls, whether it's my particular field or some other field, uh, that we follow the, uh, the request of God in that area. Well, yeah, I was reading uh, yesterday the story of our, how our university in Argentina was created. There was one man. He said, we need to turn this college into a university. And he spoke to another man. These two men decided to give it a try. And most expert, even people from the general conference went and said, this is impossible. That you, you won't find the finances. I mean, you're dreaming. This is useless. And there was strong opposition. But these two men said, it should be doable God is the one who has the funds. He owns the, all the gold in the world. If, if, if this, he wants it done, if this, he'll get done. If this has God's blessing, it, it's going to be, it, it's going to be implemented. And they just kept working and uh, the university uh, is a reality. It's been for several years. It started in 1990 something 
Now it's been uh, going on for several years. So, I mean, maybe what uh, is needed is young men with vision and, uh, I mean, determination to, to uh, beat the odds. Now, my other question yeah, was... The, the point is that it, it, those two young men didn't beat the odds. I'm sorry? Those two young men didn't beat the odds. Who? Those two young men didn't beat the odds. Well, it was God's blessing. God used them to beat the odds. And that's, that's one of the whole points, is you be listening to what God wants you to do. Yeah. And then it's when, when he tells you to do it, it's his job to make it work. Yeah. Well, by the way, the, the person who interviewed this uh, man, the, the, the main responsible for this, uh, she, she wanted to, how do you say, compliment him for his courage, etc., etc. He said, this is God's doing. I didn't do it. God did it. But of course, God uses people to do things. Yeah. And the, you know, that I mean, can be repeated with this institution. Right. There was a woman who said this needs to be done, a man who listened to her, and uh, it got done. Now, suppose... Pardon me? The general said no. The general conference said no. That is, that's right. It's the same thing happened. It's that the, the brethren didn't see the light in all this. And of course, now with the university the way it is, uh, I tend to go with the minority in this particular instance. Now, my, the other question I have is, I mean, uh, should we limit our study to determine the truth about origins to genetics? Should we use anthropology as another source? In other words, what's the evidence in uh, geology or anthropology, rather? Uh, what's the evidence? How far? do you, uh, human utensils or evidence of human activity go? How many thousand of years? Uh, do they go millions of years back? That's that, another. That all depends on how you date things. The interesting thing is that that very discussion, well, uh, the, the discussion of, of anthropology and what it can tell us about ancient humans is actually covered in the book somewhat, although from not the perspective that I would use, it's a perspective similar enough that there are some very useful facts involved. And they come to, the stated conclusions that they come to are ones that I'm comfortable with in terms of where, uh, you know, are there really human chimp uh, crosses or uh, half chimps that are turning into humans or three quarters chimps or something like that. You know, I, I think it's kind of obvious that no matter what you prove, the bias is such that the other side really won't accept it. If you, if you go through, and I haven't done an exhaustive research on this, but just looking up a few of people that you know are creationists and you look them up in Wikipedia, and they get very negative reviews, and they say that their views have been disproved by science. It's, it's just, you know. In it's fact, we'll discuss one of those uh, this next week where somebody tried to argue about uh, Michael Behe being wrong uh, while conceding the major point that he made. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Yeah, who is it that's controlling all this? And the, it's the intellectuals in the universities. The well, I don't see it as control so much as I see it as a voluntary kind of a, uh, you know, we all believe this, so we'll all kind of go along to, to support things that fit it and uh, to disagree with things that don't fit it. Now. If you're asking, is there some more explicit control, there may very well be. Unfortunately, if that's the case, it is totally untraceable. So I don't think it makes us, I don't think it helps us a lot to try to trace the control that's totally untraceable. But it, uh, uh, to recognize that it could exist, <coughs> yes, I think that's fair. I, I oh. think there is a, uh, I think there are agents other than human that 
have interests in having this particular issue confused, among others. And uh, Nick knows one of the mm. others very, very well. <laughs> uh, this is to be expected. Christ told you know, uh, people will hate you because of me. Uh, this is normal. Just go ahead and do your work. Just a minute. Can, can we get this so that we can record what you're having to say for other people that hear? Well, you've seen the film, Expel to No Intelligence Allowed. Yes. Yeah. It kind of gives you an idea. Yes, it does. It really does. Uh, yes, does that work now? <laughs> it's been working. Yeah, it does. Good. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting that the devil's first lie is the truth with the rest of the world. We aren't going to die. I mean, people are celebrating popes who are performing miracles, you know, at this point in the process of canonization. I mean, the lie is coming from the other side, the devil himself. It has continued. And uh, his primary goal is to say man has never fallen. He's continuing to evolve. And if there's no fall, there's no need for God. The Sabbath and the Sunday are very much like the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I think one of the things that's important to realize is that many of the people who are cooperating are what the communists would have called uh, useful idiots. They don't really know what they're doing. Um, they're not consciously in his conspiracy, but the entities who actually control all this stuff know how they're going to react. And in fact, it's nice to have them as, quote, independent uh, uh, verification of whatever is being proposed. Um, and it's often very hard to tell somebody who's actually committed to the whole program and somebody who just thinks the program is right and uh, doesn't even, in fact, doesn't think of it as a program. It's just the truth. Isn't that the way it is with the wheat and the weeds? They grow uh, together until the harvest? They do. They do. Now, what do we do about that? I guess. The more wheat-like we are, the better off we're going to be in terms of both our own lives and in terms of those of others. Yeah, but it's a little scary when you hear something like one of ten are prepared and the majority in the end will come from other flocks. It, it makes you, you know, lights are going to go out. Of, it makes you wonder about where we are as people who are supposedly preaching the truth. Yes, uh, I think that we're in for a whole bunch of surprises when that happens. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a student here at Romarinda, and I come from Africa, Kenya. And uh, I really want to thank God because of what he's doing this issue because God is in control still because um, I personally I came to study here and uh, I got a scholarship to study here so that I can be able prepared to go and serve in this issue particularly I'm interested in the issues in science and religion and uh, specifically in the context of Africa uh, there is a huge need for people who are committed Christians and good scientists to be in point uh, the need for us to build our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because there is a wave in Africa that uh, even some pastors, the young pastors right now of my age, they have a mentality that the science 
is having a better perspective than the Bible. And so if nothing's done, some young pastors in Africa, they have started to think that the Bible is not so much reliable. Science is the modern way of thinking. And it's good to believe what science is saying than what the Bible says. And so something has to be done, but I thank God that he's already doing something. And in the form of providing fund for us to come and study here, I see the hand of God in trying to restore the problem that is germinating, more especially in the young generation of Africa. So I thank God for that. Well, you can be thankful that, uh, that you're getting the advantage of uh, starting to rework on this, whereas in Europe and North America, in some places, it, uh, the fruit of the idea that science knows more than the Bible uh, has, um, uh, and, and that the Bible is wrong in very specific areas that, that science can show us. Um, that idea has taken fruit in, in Europe, in particular, in North America as well, uh, to the point where there, it turns out to be one of the toughest mission fields around. Um, I hope that in Africa, the answer to that kind of ideology uh, will will come earlier in the history. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to do my small part to try to make that work. You have chosen the right class. You could be in, in global in itself and be lost. So <laughs> when you come back, um, you found the right class. I'd like to. Um, Thank you, Paul. Um, no, mm -hmm. sixth grade going into an Adventist school, I knew Daniel and Revelation. I could floor any Protestant pastor. Sixth grade. Knew 2,300 prophecies, 2,300 days. Where has the story gone? Where, where are we now? And our kids have more interest in what comes out to Hollywood. Uh, I was talking with a Loma Linda graduate. And um, I says, you know, I don't know one Hollywood um, guy name. And says, you must be crazy. You must be, you must be kidding. I said, no, I have no time. I have absolutely no time for these folk. They mo make unreal things real. We're making real things unreal. What's the problem with us? You see, um, one time I was foolish enough to accept the offer to be the school board chairman in, a, in the um, in Midwest. And I was talking, I says, so where do we get our um, our guidance from, from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy. One of the board members says, never mention spirit of prophecy in this meeting again. I said, whoa, <laughs> yeah, are we in a Christian school now? You see, um, we have, my, my concern, Nick, is that we have watered down our beliefs and our faith so much. Um, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, uh, and others we spend our time on. And uh, instead of spending our time in the Bible, where does our strength come from? Fourth uh, of July, I was in Adrian, Michigan, bunch of Muslim doctors and Hindu doctors and lawyers and professors. And we were reading, and um, they found out I was a Christian and I was uh, a vegan. So they're asking, <laughs> how, could you, how could you be alive today? I mean, da, da, da. And what a Wonderful opportunity to present to them the gospel of Christ. It's really, what is our passion? Where are we? What do we want to do with our lives? What kind of kids are we producing in Adventist schools? Uh, did we, now we no longer sing these songs, did we learn these songs, dare to be a Daniel for nothing? What are those Daniels? I think that's our greatest challenge. Um, 
And you made the right decision. <laughs> Whenever I'm in town, I come to this class. I, I travel all over the world. My, the money does not come from the general conference, Paul. Uh, the Lord has led us into doing things uh, in places um, and support ourselves through uh, our profession. Um, we've got to have a burden, a vision to, to do things that can be done because the time is short. There's a little time to work. Um, there's very little time to work and we have a challenge. And, and science and religion and science uh, attracts people from all walks of life. I have uh, Dhaka University in Bangladesh, uh, one of the top universities during British time. Uh, the philosophy department chairman came to see me, uh, Mr. Nobody, when I was in Bangladesh uh, in, in December. Um, these folk want to know who we, be, who we are and what we believe in. We, we have nothing to be apologetic about. Absolutely nothing. Uh, the, the, the lifestyle, the, the faith is exciting. And this would be so great if we could really give this to our kids. Well, um, probably we should uh, close at this point, but uh, for those of you who are uh, ready to come back next week, we'll discuss some of the challenges that these people have run into. Uh, uh, interestingly, those challenges do not get published in the uh, peer-reviewed literature either. Um, I think because if they did, then they'd have to put the original in the peer-reviewed literature and they don't want to do that. Uh, how, how people manage to get this done is very interesting. Um, and we'll, we'll find where people are uh, try to cite things without citing them. And interesting material like that. Uh, but uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll give the, uh, the opposition a chance to, uh, to respond. And I, I think that uh, we have the stronger case, frankly. Um, see you next Sabbath. <laughs>